Hello and welcome. I'm Ahmed Sali and you're watching Dr. Sugar. We're back with another video for the MRCPUK PACES exam. In this video, we'll discuss a case that is one of the frequently encountered cases in Station 5 in the MRCP PACES. This is one of the very frequently encountered cases, and that's Graves' disease. The reason is, simply, it's a common disease, so you need to know how you will manage a patient with Graves' disease, and second, because it's easy to find a case for the examination. As it is normally with a Station 5 case, you're given a scenario, then you enter the consultation room, where you take history from the patient, you examine them, then you have a conversation with them about your management plan and addressing the concerns, and then you are questioned by the examiners. So, what would be the scenario for someone with Graves' disease? A typical scenario would be a young lady presenting with a constellation of symptoms that could include palpitations, weight loss, hair loss, amenorrhea, etc, etc. Now let me give you a tip. For all endocrine problems, there are always signs and symptoms related to the gland producing the hormones itself, and there will be systemic signs and symptoms that you need to take into consideration. This is particularly true for the thyroid gland. So what history would you ask when it comes to the thyroid gland itself? So when it comes to history taking, for the thyroid gland in particular, I prefer if you start with the systemic symptoms and signs first and then you go to the local neck related, thyroid related signs and symptoms. The reason being is it's more likely that you will have systemic symptoms with thyroid disease than having local symptoms. This isn't always true. It depends on the nature of the thyroid problem. If for example you have a multinodular goiter that's not producing any hormone, then local signs and symptoms are more relevant. However, because diseases like Graves' disease are quite common in the UK, then you ought to start with systemic symptoms. That is the manifestation of Graves' disease. So what do you want to ask first? As we discussed in one of the live sessions we did, you should either go system by system or just anatomically. Now when I say anatomically, it is to start head and then go to the chest, arms and legs. That could be one way to do it. The other way is just to do it system by system. For example, you want to ask questions related to the gastrointestinal tract. For example, you're asking about appetite. I do realize appetite is not controlled by the gastrointestinal tract itself directly at least but we eat through the mouth, so that's an easy way to remember it. So you'd be asking about appetite, weight loss, bowel habits. Don't ask too many questions. Make it short, make it quick, make it easy for yourself. You wanna ask about the cardiovascular system. You wanna ask about the palpitations, chest tightness. Again, don't ask too many questions. Also in the cardiovascular, although this could be something that is shared between cardiovascular and the nervous system, that's shakiness, tremor. But you obviously will ask the patient, do you have tremors? Because not all patients will know what it means to have tremor. Then you can go to the nervous system, ask about anxiousness. That's something that's quite common with them. Insomnia is common. Just feeling shaky is common. You wanna ask about the metabolic system? and ask, for example, about uh, sweat or preference to temperature. Don't waste much more time. Go to the important thing. Go to the things that they're expecting you not to forget. The eyes. Make sure you ask about the eyes. Do they have any eye symptoms? Their eyes feel dry? Do they see double? Any other eye-related symptom that you can think of that's related to graves. But again, don't waste too much time. Just let them know that you know you need to ask about the eyes, okay? A very important thing not to forget, ask about skin and hair. 
okay? Also, the reproductive system in women ask about their menstrual cycles. Unlike what most people expect, hyperthyroidism actually causes amenorrhea and hypothyroidism causes menorrhagia. I know you'd like to think that the body's in overdrive, you should have more menstrual cycles, but it's actually the only system in the body things happen in reverse with change in thyroid function. Here you can ask about symptoms related to the neck itself. For example, do they feel a lump? Do they see a lump? Do they have problems with swallowing food? Do they have problems with breathing? Did anyone tell them this voice sounds different? Because of the association with other autoimmune diseases, do not forget to ask something like, do you know if you have diabetes? Do not forget to ask about family history. That's very, very important in a patient presenting with a thyroid problem. It's important in everyone, but particularly for a thyroid problem. Just finish off by asking about medications. Do not forget to ask about smoking. And we'll know a little bit later why that's very important. Now you can start examining them. My personal advice for station 5 would actually be that you should start examining them much sooner. After you've asked them a few questions, you should start examining them because you're going to be wasting way too much time. Start examining them and continue asking questions whilst you're examining. Now in examination, you can do the exact same thing we did with history. Either start with the neck or start with the systemic review. If you're starting with systemic examination, then I would suggest that you start with the hands, very quickly feel the pulse. You should feel a pulse that is rapid. You should feel a pulse that is large in volume. However, this is not always the case because rarely they will leave a case without treatment and bring them to examination. Also in the hands, hands may be sweaty. You may be able to elicit a fine tremor you may be able to see thyroid acropache. Now enough with the hands. Have a quick look at the legs. Look for myxedema. It's very rare to see it. Most people, even in the chronologist, haven't seen myxedema. If you fancy, you can mention that you'd like to check for reflexes. They should be brisk. But even if you don't do it, I doubt you'll lose any marks. Now moving on to the important parts of examination, examining the eyes, it's important to know and to perfect your technique in examination, particularly examination of the eye. For example, if you're looking for exophthalmus, you can't comment of exophthalmus just sitting in front of the patient. This is something you would check by standing and going and standing behind the patient and looking down and see if you can see if their eyeballs are protruded. You can comment on proptosis, you need to comment on lid lag, lid retraction, you can comment on chemosis, conjunctival swelling. You can just open any book and you've got all the things that you need to be looking for. But normally, particularly not to lose time, look for lid lag, lid retraction. Make sure you didn't miss a big, big exophthalmus. And sometimes scar of tarsography, which would be the treatment for Exophthalmus. Now you're ready to examine the neck. Examination of the neck, there are different techniques. You can do it from front, you can do it from behind. I personally do it from behind. I see most doctors doing it from behind. But, you know, clinical examination books do mention both. And um, I've seen people doing it from front. So do it whichever way you prefer, as long as you can elicit the findings. Make sure you feel for the thyroid, you ask the patient to swallow, offer them some water, a sip of water would help. The dry mouth deglutition is not very easy, particularly if the patient's been doing it over and over again for all the candidates sitting the exam. You need to be commenting on how it felt, if you could feel it at all. Did you feel any nodules? Was it hard, soft, moving with deglutition as we said? Does it have a retrosternal extension? Can you feel the trachea? Feel for the lymph nodes in the neck. That's very important. Do not forget that. Make sure you auscultate over the thyroid. You need to listen for a brewery. Now you may not always hear it, particularly if the patient is treated. Now, if the diagnosis is actually graves in that patient, 
when you feel the thyroid gland, it should feel bilaterally, similarly, just mildly enlarged. You may hear the brewery, you may not. It should not be huge, you should not feel many, many notes. However, do remember, patients who get multinodular goiter could still get graves, and patients with graves could still get multinodular goiter. Now, when you've concluded your assessment, you need to tell the patient what was the diagnosis. I do not recommend saying Graves' disease straight away. I recommend saying that they have hyperthyroidism. And the way we want to word it is to say you have an overactive thyroid gland. But then you say the most likely cause is Graves' disease. And then you can explain a little bit about Graves' disease being an autoimmune disease and etc, etc, etc. Then you want to tell them about what you're going to do for them, what tests you need to do for them, because patients are programmed to ask you, how do you know? Is there a way to confirm it? So yes, there are tests that you could do. You need to mention your autoantibodies, which most of the time, on their own, with a typical history, should suffice for a diagnosis of Graves. If you want to further confirm it, then imaging can be used. We wouldn't do it routinely unless we're suspecting something else happening with the Graves. But if you were to ultrasound a gland with a Graves disease, you'll find that is uniformly enlarged bilaterally, as we said in the examination. And also there is increased blood flow in both lobes. Remember that it's only mildly enlarged. Whilst if you're going for technetium scan, then what you'd expect to see is a uniform uptake throughout the thyroid tissue. If you see a cold nodule, then that's not good news. If one part of the thyroid gland has more uptake than the rest, then that could indicate a toxic nodule in that part. Now, you don't need to mention all of this to your patient. You just need to tell them a little bit about a test, whichever test you choose to confirm the diagnosis. As I said, autoantibodies with a clinical picture, typical of Graves, should suffice for the diagnosis. And when we say autoantibodies, we're talking about TRAB, that's the thyroid receptor antibody. Then you want to tell them about their treatment options. You'd always start with giving them one of the antithyroid drugs. It's either carbinazole or PTU. Make sure you mention the lines of treatment. Treatment should be guided by the case. If you've got someone who is 90 years old, although Graves' disease manifesting for the first time in a 90 year old is unlikely, but for the argument's sake, then to tell them about definitive treatments like surgery would not be a reasonable thing to do. But if your patient is young, you still want to start with antithyroid drugs, but you could say after a certain duration, 12 to 18 months, if this didn't work, or you had a relapse after we stopped the medications, we may consider definitive treatment of some sort, and definitive treatment can be surgery, but can also be, and this is actually used even more than surgery, that is radioiodine. For antithyroid drugs, this is what you're going to be starting with. You either give them carbimazole or PTU. In the UK, general practice is to start with carbimazole unless they're pregnant or unless we know they had an adverse reaction to carbimazole that was not a granulocytosis. Which brings me to a very important point. Just after you mention, we're going to start you on this medication, you need to tell the patient a little bit about possible side effects. You should do that for any medication with any patient anywhere, not only in the exam. But in the exam, if you're starting the patient on antithyroid drug, what they want you to say to the patient is to give them warning about feeling unwell, having a sore throat, having a fever, and what they need to do when that happens. You need to be telling them they need to go to their GP or to A&E, and to ask for a blood test. Normally the medical practitioner there would know what blood test it is. If their counts are normal, they can go back on their treatment. Another important tip is if the patient is a lady and a childbearing age, you need to mention to them, if you become pregnant and they're on carbimazole, they need to contact their GP or contact the endocrine unit and have their medication switched to PTU. 
Now, another aspect of drug treatment that is very, very important and you should not forget it is symptomatic management. Because if the patient is coming in with palpitations and feeling shaky and being anxious, they don't really care about your explanation of what's going to happen to the thyroid hormone. The antithyroid drug will not act fast enough for the symptoms to go. So the magic word is propranolol. Now we get to the interesting bit. It's time for the examiners. They would only have time to ask you a couple of questions, three max. What they may ask you is, independent of hyperthyroidism, what other things that you expect to see in someone with Graves? You want to say goiter, you want to say pretibial myxedema, you want to say thyroid acropachy, and you want to say Graves ophthalmopathy. Another question would be, what are the contraindications of radioiodine? Or what you should tell the patient if you're sending them for radioiodine? So the answer would be is to avoid contact with children and pregnant women for at least two weeks. Pregnancy is an absolute no and it should not happen for at least four months after the treatment and they should know that there is a risk becoming hypothyroid. Now sometimes they would ask about treatment of ophthalmopathy but really really in real life you would refer them to an ophthalmologist but anyway you'd give systemic steroids radiotherapy or you just do an orbital decompression surgery. Another important question that may pop up in the exam in relation to Graves ophthalmopathy that is what protective measures the patient can take. This is where the smoking question comes in. They should quit smoking. They should lubricate their eyes with eye drops. They should sleep upright. Prism glass can be used to correct diplopia and they can be referred to an ophthalmologist that's an ophthalmology surgeon to do lateral tassography. This is it guys, that's Graves' disease. Very important to know it well because it's one of the frequently encountered cases both in an exam and in your real life. I hope you benefited from the video. If you have, please subscribe to the channel and activate the notification button so that you don't miss any of the future videos. Also make sure you share the video with your colleagues so that everyone can benefit. If you have any questions or comments, make sure you leave them in the comment section and I will answer your question as soon as possible. Thank you very much for watching. Good luck with your preparation for the exam. See you in the next video.